we have um, invisible populations um, that in policy don't end up um, appearing and consequently if they're not there they're not they're not they're not seen to um, and uh, women rural women female head of households uh, smallholder farmers um, uh, uh, adolescent girls there there are a whole lot of uh, uh, people groups and, and I'm talking about them and but at the same time think about the broader minority and vulnerable groups in our society how do we actually recognize the role of different sources of data whether it is data from indigenous knowledge systems whether it's data from grassroots organizations and how that becomes part and parcel of when we talk about data from this kind of international global level so it's something we really need to think about who produces data who controls data who has access to it but what does the data actually speak to When you think about the way data and information and indigenous knowledge has been abused over time and you see that definitely in the pharmaceutical industry a lot of indigenous cures and remedies have been utilized by the pharmaceutical companies to make large profits on medicines and i think that that's something that needs to be addressed in terms of providence because otherwise it could be scaled to an extent in algorithms to basically obliterate cultures we found out that uh, just basic um, issues such as common code lists or in terms of for example categories and so on um, or even the quality and standards of the data that's generated between different agencies when these are not consistent or not good enough, they provide barriers towards scaling up and joined up data. So, um, and we've seen this especially happening during COVID-19, uh, for example, when um, trying to provide, say, welfare aid, where five different agencies have different data points and they're all inconsistent or not able to work with each other. 